So uh, our, uh, it's a great pleasure again to uh, present the paper. So this is a joint work with uh, Vivian at uh, UT Austin on how do complementers uh, respond to the threat of platform entry, the uh, platform uh, owner entry. Right. So. Uh, yeah, I guess I won't uh, need to say more to this audience, right? So today we are really in the age of platforms, right? Here are some popular examples, right? And these platforms created a tremendous amount of value, right, to, uh, to our society, to our economy. But it's also important to recognize that uh, uh, these platforms are not creating values alone by themselves, right? Millions of entrepreneurs, right, often we refer to them as complementers, right? They are actually co-creating this value together with these platform owners, right? So this research is really about uh, this uh, uh, complementers, right, developing applications or services on top of these platforms uh, and uh, about uh, their performance, right. So uh, after talking to many of these complementers, uh, we realized that uh, one of the concerns or top concerns of these complementers is that they are really worried that at some point, right, the platform owners actually may imitate them and start to kind of introduce similar products to compete directly against them, right. So in the 90s, we all know, right, this familiar story that Microsoft used that strategy essentially embrace extend, right, to kill many of the complementary application uh, providers like Netscape, uh, real networks, etc., right. But the story certainly didn't stop with uh, Microsoft, right? Today, if you look at the bigger platforms uh, today, like uh, uh, iOS, right, uh, or Android, right? So with every release of new iOS, Apple would uh, actually kill a bunch of uh, uh, app companies, right? So for instance, with the release of iOS 7, right, Apple uh, included the Flashlight application as uh, the default feature on the phone. As a result, right, Flashlight application, third-party Flashlight application companies uh, are in trouble, right? So, uh, but it turns out that uh, uh, before iOS 7, right, Flashlight application used to be the uh, the most popular uh, uh, apps right uh, on uh, Apple's I uh, the iOS store. And if you look at the Google's Android system, right, so, and uh, lots of uh, uh, smartphone uh, makers are actually very worried about Google, right, because, I mean, they all build their uh, uh, devices on top of the same, uh, same platform, right. So one way some of these uh, device manufacturers are trying to differentiate themselves is actually to introduce innovative applications on top of the Android platform. But it turns out that uh, when they introduce some innovative applications uh, uh, on Android platform uh, and these applications work, worked out really well in the marketplace, right, Google would actually update the Android system to embrace this innovation and make this innovation available to everybody, right? So that strategy didn't work for some of the uh, smartphone makers. So in this research, right, we try to kind of uh, uh, answer two questions, right? So how do complementers, right, respond to this kind of a threat, right? Essentially, the, the moment you started to kind of develop applications or services on top of a platform, you should worry about the potential uh, uh, scenario that the platform owner may enter at some point, right? How do you react to the, that, that kind of threat, right? How does that kind of threat change your rate and the direction of innovation we look at, right? How uh, do uh, complementers adjust their product prices in response to the change to the changes in the threats right and we also try to look at how do such uh, responses, right, complementers' responses to the potential uh, threats differ from the responses uh, when platform owners actually enter their marketplace, right? So we actually do a, a comparison as well. So uh, uh, this work is related to uh, several streams of literature, right? So there is uh, a stream of literature looking at the, the tension essentially between platform owners and the complementers, right? So there are theoretical models, the qualitative evidence, and also limited uh, empirical evidence around that as well, right? So most of these papers would uh, be focusing on the, the actual entry, not the entry threat, right? And uh, there is also a stream of literature looking at how companies respond to the threat of entry, right, uh, outside the platform set. Right. So, but the, uh, only a, a very few paper in this literature, right? Uh, Gooseby's paper and uh, and also uh, Prince's paper. They are all about South, uh, Southwest Airlines, right? And uh, uh, Robert's paper is about the uh, the cable companies, right? And. Uh, and uh, the reason we don't have lots of papers in this literature is because uh, it's actually very hard to observe threat of entry. You can easily observe the actual entry, but the empirically it's just difficult to detect that. Yeah. And also there is a string of literature looking at broadly at the, the relationship between competition and innovation. Right. Most of the uh, works are looking at uh, uh, innovation efforts only, but in our case we'll be looking at both the efforts and also the directions as well. 
So uh, the, uh, very quickly, the, the research design is that we're going to use this uh, Android mobile platform as our research setting, right? And we will be looking at how app developers on Android, right, adjust their rate and the direction of innovation efforts and also prices in response to changes in Google's entry threat and actual entry in the Android app market. And in order to identify Google's entry threat, we're going to use essentially Apple's moves as a way to identify uh, the, the increase in the entry threat, right? The idea here is that uh, Apple and Google, they compete head to head, right, with each other, right? So for instance, Apple had uh, like introduced, like for instance, uh, uh, Apple Health, Google would immediately introduce Google Fit, right? Apple had the Siri, Google would upgrade the Google Voice, right? Apple had the Flashlight application, Google also embrace the flashlight application as a default feature in the Android system, right? So we use Apple's move, right, uh, 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 as a way to uh, infer the change in the perception about the entry threat from Google. Right. So uh, just to uh, give you a, a concrete uh, example to illustrate our empirical approach here, right? If we take the flashlight uh, market as one example, right? So Apple entered the flashlight uh, market in June 2013, and Google entered this market in November 2014, right? And uh, August 2015 is the end of our sample period, right? So take an a Android developer of flashlight application as one example, right? So after Apple's entry, right, before Google's entry, we think that this app developer is already under an uh, increased level of, of entry threat from Google, essentially, right? So given that Apple has already done this, Google is likely to do it in the future. Right. So we ask questions whether this app developer is going to adjust its innovation or uh, price on this affected app, right? And then after Google's actual entry, we ask, right, whether this app developer is going to respond differently now, right, compared with the pre-entry, pre-actual entry period. And we could also take this app developer's other applications. So this app developer also has uh, uh, developed a QR scanner, right? That's another app, right? So we ask, right, whether this app, uh, app developers would adjust its innovation effort or uh, adjust anything, right, around this uh, unaffected app. But in this case, this unaffected app is developed by the affected app developer, right? And then we could also take a look at another app developer, right? That app developer that didn't develop the flashlight application, right? And but this app developer developed this uh, also another QR uh, uh, scanner here, right? And so we ask like whether uh, what's what's happening with this app developer, right? So because this is really an unaffected application developed by unaffected developer, so we use this as our control group. Right? So essentially, we have two treatment groups here, right? There might be because there might be some spillover effect, right, from this affected to the, uh, app to the unaffected uh, app because it's uh, with the same app developer. Yeah. So uh, the research design again is uh, essentially diff in diff model, right, uh, to compare the outcome of three groups, right. So one group is affected app developers affected app. We call it ADAA, right, and for lack of better names, right. And the affected uh, the, uh, another treatment group is affected developers unaffected apps, right, ADUA, which allows us to actually uh, look at whether there is a shift in the re uh, innovation direction or not, right. And our control group would be this unaffected app developers unaffected apps, right? And we use as control group and also uh, we make sure that this, uh, all these controlled apps are in the same category as these affected apps and also they are released before Apple's entry so that we have the pre-treatment uh, data, right? So because we have two kind of uh, uh, treated groups, Right, and also we have two events. Right, uh, one is uh, uh, entry threat, another is uh, actual entry. So in the end, right, in the diff in diff model, we have essentially four interaction variables. Right, so under entry threats, on, uh, under actual entry, these are dummies. Right, so we also interact with uh, them with uh, whether it's uh, uh, the 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 ADA group or ADUA group or not. Right, the controls are used as a benchmark, so it's not included here. And we also control for app-specific effect, right? app-level effect, and also uh, we also control for uh, time-specific uh, effects, right? Uh, so both, uh, two fixed effects here. And the outcome variables are going to essentially be some innovation outcomes uh, in terms of number of updates and also the prices, right? And the, the product prices for these apps. Right. 
So data, we obtained a data set uh, uh, for a total of around 200,000 apps. These are all active apps, right, from the, uh, in the Google Play stores from an app uh, company, right? So uh, these apps, uh, for these apps, we have the description, categories, release date, publisher, right, essentially the developer's name. And also we ha have all the information about their release events, right, new updates, and the price change events, user ratings, rankings for the top 500 only, right, uh, because Google only provides uh, uh, the uh, the ratings for uh, rankings for the top 500 apps uh, in, in, on each day actually uh, and we aggregate all this information to the monthly level so we have monthly data from January 2012 to uh, August 2015. Uh, from this set, we also dropped all these corporate apps, right? So corporate apps are these apps developed by, for instance, uh, United Airlines, Southwest Airlines, right? So these apps are going apps are going to be very different from like Snapchats, right? So we thought that, like uh, these apps uh, are really not just mobile apps, right? To some extent, so we dropped all these apps, and also we dropped all these apps released after the matched uh, entry threats, right? Because we want uh, the pre-treatment uh, uh, data to be used as uh, controls, yeah. And uh, uh, we also uh, manually compiled a list of apps and also important uh, iOS features released by Apple, right, from this period of time, right? And so here is essentially a list, right? So uh, in total, Apple basically introduced uh, 31 apps, right, 31 apps. And uh, uh, among these uh, 31 entry events, uh, Google entered uh, 25 of them. 25 of them, right? D during the time period we are studying, right? Could, could be more if we look uh, at, it, uh, at the uh, phenomena today. But the overlap is already 81%, right? So indeed, we could really use Apple's entry events to really predict the Google's moves, right? And uh, of these uh, 25 cases, actually Apple entered 20 of them earlier than Google, right? So, so that's why we use Apple's entry as uh, the, the, uh, the, the signal to, uh, for the change in the entry threat uh, instead of the other way around. And uh, it turns out that all uh, we could study all, of, uh, all 20 of them, but uh, because of our data limitation, because our data started in January 2012, uh, uh, right? So we could actually only focus on three of them, right? Because uh, we want the entry events to happen, right? After the beginning of our uh, data sample, right? So we will be focusing on these three uh, scenarios, right? So three apps, right? Apple introduced guided access. It's more like a par uh, parental control, right? Uh, podcast is uh, like like a, a program that allows you to share music, music files, right? And uh, Flashlight, right? Flashlight uh, is uh, another application, yeah. And uh, in two of uh, these three events, like uh, Google actually entered later on. Uh, for a uh, podcast, Google hasn't entered yet. Yeah. So uh, we also try to identify all these uh, affected apps and uh, their associated developers, right? So uh, we took a, a bunch of approaches. Uh, in the end, we figured that this approach actually gave us a, a reasonable set after we actually manually checked the result, right? So we started with uh, manually identifying a few affected uh, Android apps, right? So they, we know that uh, these apps must be affected for each Apple's entry events. Then we use Google Store's uh, similar apps feature, right, to get additional affected apps, right? based on these apps, right? And uh, even after we gather this list, we consider developers of these affected apps as affected developers, right? So very quickly, some summary statistics, right? So for each event, right, we compile the, uh, the number of affected apps by affected developers, uh, number of unaffected apps by these affected developers, and also number of unaffected apps by these unaffected uh, developers, right, in each uh, uh, scenario. And the one takeaway here is that we actually have sufficient number of observations, right, in, in, in each case. And uh, fresh, in the case of fresh lights, right, the numbers are, uh, are usually higher than uh, in other cases. But uh, this is also consistent with uh, our impression because if you do a, a search in iOS store or Android store for flashlights, you actually will have, uh, see uh, hundreds, hundreds of applications there, right? And uh, here are some summary statistics, right? So we look at the updates, we look at the price, we also have dummy variables for different groups. ADA is essentially the primary affected group. ADUA is like the uh, affected groups through the spillover effect, right? We also have dummies to control for entry threat, actual entry. We also control for the number of competitors, right? I mean, uh, each app developers are competing with, right? Uh, in, uh, from other third-party app developers, right? And we also control for the age of this app, right? From 
on the day it was uh, released. So regressions, right? So the dependent variables here is going to be essentially the number of up total updates in a month, right? So we, because the app can be developed, uh, updated multiple times uh, in each month. And uh, uh, we also use a log of the price, right, of these apps, right? And uh, so uh, the focus here are these uh, interaction variables here. So what we discovered is that uh, when uh, these uh, uh, affected apps, right, they are, when they are under entry thread, before the actual entry, they, uh, these app developers already started to drop the innovation effort, right? And then on the actual entry, they dropped the innovation effort even further, right? So we did the t-test, these two are uh, uh, very significantly different. And in terms of price, it turns out that the, when they are under entry, th entry threat, they started actually to increase the price, right? When they are under actual entry, they increase the price even further, right? So this is uh, consistent with the story when, uh, co when companies companies face competition, they started to kind of uh, uh, take advantage of these uh, price insensitive users, right? They say, okay, I mean, given that Google is going to uh, have a free version of a, a, a application very soon, then if you still value my product, presumably I should charge more, right? And the old strategy of saying that, okay, let's give away the application for free, hopefully we generate a huge install base, then we could sell to the advertisers. That strategy probably is not going to work because I mean, you know, like uh, in the future, you will be killed by Google, right? Because I mean that. And, uh, and uh, then uh, when look at uh, their other applications, these are unaffected applications developed by affected developers. What we found is that uh, actually these app developers started to shift some of the innovation efforts to these other applications they are developing, right? And uh, on the on the uh, the price on the price dimension, they didn't do very much. They didn't change the the the, uh, the price of these unaffected applications. So we've also done a bunch of robustness checks, right? One thing we did is to do some uh, uh, timing falsification exercise to make sure that, okay, this effect only shows up when the entry thread emerges. Didn't show up before the entry thread takes place, right? So indeed, right, for both groups, right, if uh, we look at the uh, entry, uh, the pre-entry thread period, we didn't see significant differences across these uh, uh, treatment groups and also the control groups. And also, we also did some falsification tests using markets where Google entered before Apple, right? So if Google had already entered the market, then Apple's uh, entry shouldn't send any entry threat signals anymore, right? So indeed, we didn't find any reactions, right, uh, in, uh, if we uh, focus on this, uh, these markets, right? And we also take, uh, took a quick look at how Google's entry threats can affect the ranking of these apps, right? And so our dependent variable is uh, whether this app is ranked in top overall top 100 or not, right? So consistent with uh, uh, our results from, the in, uh, from how they devote their innovation efforts uh, and also the innovation directions, right? We found that uh, these affected apps, right, in general, uh, have a lower ranking, right, uh, 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 are less likely to be uh, in top 100 uh, once they are under entry threat, uh, entry threat, or once they are under uh, actual entry. But these unaffected apps are more likely to be in top 100, right? So, presumably, it's caused by this shift, right, in the innovation effort. And we also look at the, the heterogeneity across different app companies because some app companies are really good. Some app companies are not so good, right? We would actually expect these uh, app companies uh, that are really good to react more, right? Because, uh, I mean, Google's entry presumably can have uh, a bigger effect on their market share, right? If you are not very good, then whether you are killed by Google or other, another top app company is uh, like uh, more or less the same to you, right, to some extent. So we basically did like this subsample analysis. Uh, what we found interestingly is that uh, when these uh, really good app companies, top app companies, right, uh, they are under entry threat, they actually expand their innovation effort and they didn't increase the price, right? This is very different from the average uh, app company, right? So our explanation here is that most likely these companies are thinking uh, about acquisition, presumably, right? So if uh, uh, I know Google is interested in this market, right, if I can show up as a very attractive candidate for Google, right, to make a case that actually you can just buy me, not uh, instead of developing 
the app yourself, then maybe this is the option, right? So then you should expand your innovation effort. But again, right, after the actual entry, the innovation effort dropped, right, no longer increased, and they also raised the price, right, because that's like, a, yeah, uh, 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 the acquisition presumably didn't happen, right? And uh, uh, in terms of this, uh, uh, they are unaffected apps developed by them, right? So they behave very similar to the averages. So they, they also shifted their innovation effort uh, to these unaffected uh, uh, apps. So we also look at like uh, uh, so the new product introduction in this market, right? So the question we're asking: Do developers, right, whether you're affected or unaffected, right, uh, release uh, uh, more or fewer like uh, similar apps, right? So are you still going to release the uh, fresh light applications after, like, for instance, Apple has already entered and after Google actually entered, right? And uh, so we actually took a look at like uh, uh, these uh, three scenarios. Right, so it's very obvious, like uh, after uh, uh, after the entry threat, right? Basically, uh, like uh, the number of fresh light applications dropped significantly in the marketplace, right? Both by affected developers or, and also unaffected developers, right? And uh, on the actual entry, it dropped even further, right? So this is the same pattern for guided access. In the case of podcast, we only have like this entry threat, but we still see significant decline, right? Measured both in terms of the actual number and also the percentage of applications uh, uh, in that month. Yeah. And also we ask whether these affected developers release more unrelated apps, right? So you could shift uh, innovation efforts to your existing, other existing applications, but you could also release new applications, right? So what we found that in each of these three scenarios, right, and these uh, uh, affected developers, right, these affected developers are more likely to introduce uh, new applications, essentially. So, uh, and these applications uh, are, are unrelated to the ones that Apple and Google uh, have already expressed the interest in. Right? So, uh, the takeaway here is that uh, it turns out that uh, indeed, right, there is this uh, shift in the innovation direction, both from uh, these affected apps to these uh, unaffected apps, and also from affected apps to these uh, new market spaces, right, where they try to release new applications. So uh, to summarize the research, right? So we essentially documented that uh, these complementers, right? I mean, we tend to think of them as uh, like a small play, uh, one or two, like a, like a software individual software developers, right? In many cases, right? They are actually quite strategic, right? And they actually understand the entry threat, right? So they would actually adjust their innovation efforts, the directions, even before the actual competition comes into the marketplace, right? And their reactions are actually different, uh, actually, on the entry threat and also. Actual, uh, actual entry, right? And we also documented a significant uh, he heterogeneity, right, in their responses depending on uh, the quality of these complementers. And uh, so uh, another thing like, uh, uh, we found interesting is that uh, these complementers, right, once they're affected by the platform owners, right, they didn't really completely abandon the platform, right, to some extent. That's actually good news for the platform owners, right, because you could actually use your entry strategy as a way to uh, uh, like, uh, 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 force people, right, to, to some extent uh, guide people, right, to change their innovation direction, right? So maybe that's actually a strategy for uh, platform owners to actually uh, 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 influence, right? Influence its uh, ecosystem. Right. So uh, that's all we have. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to discuss this paper, which is uh, really well written and, and insightful. I really enjoyed it. Um, in fact, most of my comments will be potentially for, for a follow-on paper um, and, and on ways to make some of the results uh, more robust. Um, I want to highlight, uh, uh, I mean, Feng went over a lot, uh, and, and, and I think he's really addressing a first-order question, right? So as we have more and more of this ecosystem emerge, what, what is the, the, the reaction to complementers uh, to the threat of entry, which, uh, as he was mentioning, is really difficult to observe. In fact, Rob's paper and, and the Southwest paper are, are some of the few exceptions, as well as entry, so the actual event where, where, where you're uh, competing. Um, they have really fine-grained results on the rate and direction of innovation, which is also usually very difficult to observe, right? Often we observe rate, but not really direction in, in a meaningful way. Um, and I think they find really interesting heterogeneous effects by type. You can think of them as a high type, right? A professional uh, app developer and a lower type. Um, why you should care, I think it's because 
it, it gets at the core of trade-offs in platform policy design, right? So if you're Apple or if you're Google, how should you think about these moves? How should you think about timing? Uh, how often should you incorporate features, right? Which often gives higher quality to the user versus kind of give the developers a bit more slack. Uh, and I'll hit at this at the end. I think there's a basic tension that we see always around IP between short-term and long-term uh, incentives. <clears throat> I, I love the research design, I think it's really clever, and it really takes advantage of the fact that these two players are battling each other, um, and they're monitoring each other and kind of tracing each other's actions uh, in a way that you know, can give you some plausible exogenous vari variation uh, in, in what happens in, within the ecosystem. <clears throat> so, what makes the setting particularly good is that, again, as I mentioned, you can separate thread from entry, but also you have all this additional data that uh, they've collected, right? So this is a uh, humongous amount of effort. I mean, Feng went through it really quickly, uh, but they collected not just you know the app data, which anybody can often buy, uh, but they also coded the features, they mapped them between the two platforms, they collected news announcement to really figure out, you know, is this feature something that iOS doesn't have or, or the other way around? They do a lot of great robustness. Um, Feng went through uh, uh, some of it, the multi-homing, right? Clear concern where you're kind of operating on multiple fronts. The awareness effect, he didn't uh, discuss this too much, but the idea that, oh, suddenly now everybody thinks about the flashlight. Um, they do robustness on the timing of the effect, as you would expect from a good differences and differences, and they do reverse entry as a placebo, which I think is also really clever. Uh, so here are some thoughts for, for how to, to, to improve it or, or even think about follow-on research. Um, actually, before I do that, I just want to quickly summarize the results because there's so many, so that I think all of you uh, will, will remember at least some of the key ones. Uh, what happens to the rate? Slowdown in development, right? So as soon as you see the threat, most of these debe developers stop investing in these apps, and they invest even less after entry. What's interesting is that prices move kind of in the opposite way. After the threat, they increase them slightly, and, and then they increase even more after entry. And as you would expect, they reallocate their, their human capital, right? So they start developing more uh, and dev improving the other apps. Uh, what I really like is this idea of the I-types, right? So uh, I think here there's actually quite a nuance on how these people think about the strategic response. Um, it, they seem to embrace for the storm, right? So they realize that, look, we're going to be commodified. So we either move up the chain, maybe by adding new features, since we have a captive user base, after all, right, with updates or, you know, uh, in-app in purchases. Um, and they seem to be investing in market share. So these really smarter developers, what they're doing is they're accelerating development. So acceleration could be also a result of like, I had a time schedule for some of these apps and I was releasing them on an optimal level. Maybe I coded some features, but I don't release them all at once. Uh, so that could accelerate that uh, because it's a large effect, plus 7.5%. Uh, but also they become more aware of differentiation on the other apps. They accelerate development even on their other portfolio apps. Um, and this is interesting because it relates actually the, the increasing prices relates to a lot of the literature on generics, right? If you think about what happens when generics come in, drug branded ones raise their prices. Uh, a lot of this is intangible, right? When you see different apps, you compare some logos, they kind of all look credible and, and reasonable ways to answer your problem. Often price is a signal. At least I know I use it as a way sometimes if I need really something done, okay, maybe the, the app that stop ranking with a decent price is it, probably the one that will get the job done. Uh, so I think that you're seeing that they're both investing in market share and trying to kind of move up the food chain uh, before competition comes in. Um, so what, what, can, what, what can the authors do? I think one of the main limitations is that there's three entry events, right? And, and the three entry events raise kind of some concerns about the endogenous complementary complementor entry process. I will unpack this a little bit more, but flashlight turns out it's kind of a feature. Parenta controls is something that we are used to, right, from operating system browsers. And podcast, which is the third one, existed already in macOS and iTunes. So at some point, everybody, I think, would have expected Apple to move into podcast on, on, on the iOS. Um, but I, they have really rich data. So I think, um, I mean, it may be additional data collection, but by expanding the set, I think they'll be able to tell a really rich story. And maybe this is a different paper on, on, on kind of this very nuanced response uh, to, the, to the, you know, increasing competition. Um, People typically think of Apple as kind of the late adopter of some of these features. Like we always see the Android crowd saying, oh, finally iOS has that feature that we had for years. Uh, so how hard is it to test the reverse? And, and maybe there's data 
constraints, but it seems like this app data is becoming more and more available. And this is kind of a low in fruit where you kind of invert your design and try to see maybe competition in the iOS ecosystem is slightly different, and, and that could be interesting on its own. Um, I would like to see how the effects change with the definition of the control group, right? Can you make it more narrow, more, more close in terms of keywords, in terms of uh, some of the categories and subcategories? Uh, because productivity is a fairly broad category, and we worry about you know, if the controls are not really doing their, their job in the best way. Um, I also think you could test the market share hypothesis. So if the top um, players are trying to gain market share, right, so that you know, they have a locked-in user base, Maybe they're doing price drops, right? So you, you have the price month by month, but right now you take either the min or the max, right? You take kind of a, uh, a lowest point. Uh, what if you see actually doing fire sales and then reverting the price? Because that's a way to get on the charts, and I think it would be very consistent with this idea of like, I want to just you know gain as many users as I can while, while I have their attention. Um, here's where I, I really love the paper. I think. Direction of innovation is extremely hard to, to capture in many different fields. In patents, I think people have used you know, classifications to their most possible extent, but this is a setting where you have actually much more rich data than anybody had before. Uh, and, and you can think of also like complementary type. Are these people that go for volume, they go for price, are they going for paid versus in-app purchases? What kind of is their behavior and how does that affect the response? Uh, are they innovators, right? Are they the ones that try to lead this space with novel apps or are they imitators? I think there's a sea of me too apps that you know, work on search engine optimization and try to just get downloads. But there's a crop of people that are actually really useful to the ecosystem because they push the boundaries of what we do with our phones. And I think Apple cares and, I, and, and Google care a lot about those and, and don't want to undermine their role because that, that will have a negative effect in the long run. Um, there's website now that I think release some of the release history and I wonder if you could use the size of the release in terms of you know just kilobytes but also megabytes probably more more, more likely <coughs> but also machine learning to cluster since they release a text right some people would say bug fixes and speed updates some others will tell you oh, new features can you kind of build a taxonomy of are they trying to differentiate from from others are they trying to build a user base and, and kind of moving up the chain which you would see if they suddenly the flashlight also allows you to do something else? Or are they just bugs fixing and, and increasing speed? Quality, right? So that could be a really a dimension that you could actually get at if, if quality versus features uh, changes after entry. The other one could be if you don't find that you know, they're actually improving the value, maybe they're just going for attention. Every time you go and you see the screen of updating apps, you click on it and it kind of reminds you that you even have that app. So maybe they're just going for an attention story knowing that you know, at some point they'll be discounted and, and forgotten. <coughs> At the eye level, I think your paper is, uh, is a paper that can have a major contribution on this idea of like the tension between innovation and competition. I think you frame it in that light, but the, the basic idea is between static and dynamic efficiency. And I think when we think about patents, this is something that everybody has in mind, but like when we think about endogenous sorting, there, there's at least two types of complementers. People that do low investments, that you, you really just trying to monetize on a short time horizon and do incremental innovation, right? The flashlight types. And then maybe there's people that, you know, end nodes or whatever those apps that really add a lot of functionality are making tangible investments. They do value stability, right? Because they want to recover their investment. And, and they push these novel apps that redefine what you can actually do with an iPhone. So think of them as the guys that do real R&D and the guys that are kind of you know, going for the low hanging fruit. Um, I think when we think about the dynamic effects of you know, Apple or Google renegating on the promise of letting you run on their platform, the biggest cost is on these people, right? So the people that actually do make those tangible investments that, that reshape what the ecosystem is about. Um, and it makes you wonder, maybe Apple is slower to respond exactly because they're aware that you know, if we incorporate every feature, you give less time to, to the ecosystem to develop. But you really have really interesting data um, to, to look at that. And then I have a bunch of other minor suggestions. But I, I love the paper. And I think uh, if not in this paper, there, there's something about, again, this tension between how do you manage a platform that um, your data will allow you to address. Thank you.
Well, thanks so much for all these uh, thoughtful, very valuable comments, right? So uh, uh, I won't uh, respond to all of them, but uh, 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 but uh, some of them are extremely interesting. We should definitely explore, right? Especially, for instance, uh, looking into these five cells, right? So because uh, even when we investigate the price pattern, we notice that the, the app prices can actually vary tremendously, even for a given app, right? So so the, the, the app with the highest price is uh, 299 and uh, then it turns out that uh, uh, the, that only showed up like uh, for a period of time and then drop down to like 99 cents, right? So this uh, app developers are uh, certainly like uh, quite a strategic uh, in doing all this uh, like uh, marketing or, or short sales, right? And we should definitely also think more about the different types of innovators as uh, Christian mentioned. Like uh, some of these uh, 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 app developers are good at developing Me Too products, right? So they are not innovators. Some of these app developers are very innovative. They are likely to identify these uh, new marketplaces, new market needs, and uh, uh, they actually invest a lot already right so they are likely to be affected more right but for these app developers presumably they should think about this marketplace as a, a place where they should dis uh, leverage their uh, capability of discovering new apps repeatedly right, in a sense so as a result we should see these app developers are more likely to develop new apps uh, uh, after they are affected compared to this like a me too app developers right so because they are always in the waiting mode right and uh, we also thought a little bit about uh, looking at the reverse in the sense that how Apple's app developers are affected by Google's entry. But uh, we feel like uh, Google's entry probably will send uh, a, a weaker signal to uh, Apple's app developers. Part of the reason is that uh, Apple released 31 apps, right? And uh, Google actually uh, uh, later on uh, uh, previously released the similar apps. The overlap rate is 81%. Uh, 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 but uh, Google actually is uh, uh, releasing lots of uh, like uh, apps by itself. Uh, Google released uh, more than 200 apps, right? So given that Apple only released 31 apps, right? So it's very hard to use Google's entry as a signal to the Apple community to see, okay, Apple is very likely to release these apps because the overlap is uh, going to be very small. But uh, again, this could be used as almost like a possible test to, to show that the reaction might be uh, weaker here, right? And also, uh, uh, like the other comments related to doing more machine learning, all these things to understand uh, to understand the degree of the upgrades. Yeah, so so we definitely can look into this. Yeah, we have all the data. Yeah. Uh, run the, the, the regressions only uh, considering app developers who are in Android but not in, in the App Store. And the second one is if uh, you looked at how many updates of the operating system Google uh, uh, released in that time because maybe app developers are, are releasing less or fewer updates because uh, Google is updating the, the operating system uh, less. So some of the, of, the, of the updates of the app developers will be responses to the update by by, by Google. Mm, yes. So for the first comment, uh, actually, I forgot to mention, we did actually did the robustness check by dropping all these uh, multi-homing app developers, right? Drop all their products. In the sense that uh, if you are multi-homing, then, I mean, the, the, your change in your behavior might be triggered by direct competition, right? Because the Apple might be doing something instead of this entry threat, right? So in, in, indeed, this could be a confounding effect. And we did do the analysis, and the results are more or less the same as the baseline results. And uh, yeah, so we could definitely look into uh, uh, Google's update frequencies, right, uh, for the Android system. But uh, uh, in the case of Google, right, uh, also in the case of both Google and Apple, right, so there are three different ways they could introduce apps, right. One is uh, to actually build the app as a feature, right. So it's not like a separate app, like a fresh light is actually a feature. It's not a separate applications, right. Another is introducing an app when you introduce a major upgrade to iOS or to Android, right. So in that case, if Google slow down the, uh, the, pro uh, the, the process of updating Android, then it's actually good for the community because Google is less likely to introduce all these apps together with the uh, operating system. But uh, uh, there are also several cases where the, uh, uh, the platform owners will just develop like an app, right? So you can actually download them. It's not the default app, but the, it's an app developed by Google, right? And Google will find other ways, of course, to encourage it, you to download these apps, right? So this is a, a third way. So so maybe one way to think about it is that maybe in the third case, the effect is uh, uh, 
should be weaker, right? Because, uh, uh, I mean, then these app developers are in a, a kind of a f in almost in a fair comp uh, in a fair competition with the uh, platform owner, right? So we could definitely look into this. Uh, uh, excellent paper, and uh, so uh, two things. Uh, first of all, the specification looks like it just ignores free apps, like ad-supported free apps, since they don't have price changes. Uh, no. So it would include uh, all these, uh, whether it's uh, a, a free app or uh, ad-based, right? And the price were both were just be zero, right? In the specification. And the other one was um, when Google updates an app or updates a feature on their operating system, not all handsets are eligible to get that update. So not everybody is actually able to get the new feature. Totally. And if something only works on Marshmallow, then there's like a huge install base who just can't get it, where the apps are still viable. That's less of an issue on Apple, because uh, they push out their updates to everybody over the air, whether they want it or not. We're, we're, uh, there's a significant problem with updating of Android, because uh, OEMs sort of stand in the way. And that's another reason why we uh, only, uh, that's another reason we only look at this uh, 31 events, right, because uh, uh, triggered by Apple, right, in that case, like uh, most of the Google's uh, response in developing their own apps uh, would be affecting the whole, like, marketplace, right. So, and also, we also got data only for the U.S. market only, right, so these downloads uh, are only for the U.S. market, right, and uh, actually even for the updates, right, sometimes the app developer will uh, develop update for a particular version of their apps for a particular version of the uh, Android system because uh, I mean it's only affecting another, a, 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 a separate country basically outside the US right and uh, and certainly like in China for instance all the Google apps are blocked there right so I mean uh, yeah so uh, yeah we could look into this a little bit more could it be also an interesting dimension to look at like uh, uh, the global effect right from, from uh, platform owners entry yeah yeah, I was just thinking basically if it requires a newer version of the Android operating system for this feature to work uh, that mm -hmm. sort of protects the app developers. Because mm -hmm. not as many of them are at threat. Now, I mean, you only got three events there. I'm not sure how much variation you're going to find. Sure, sure, yes. So uh, I, I like the paper a lot. And it, you have data that uh, allow us to see the results that we otherwise we, we would not be able to see. But I'm wondering how much of those results are really due to the platform structure, because there is no intellectual property uh, protection with with apps. So how much is it that it's just uh, strategic behavior under limited intellectual property? So I develop if I, if if my app be, uh, becomes really popular, that I know there will be other competitors coming and just claiming my market share. Uh, how? How much, so how does it matter that it's a platform structure or just some other technology where we would not have a platform or network effects? Are there even network effects in the, in the analysis? So I'm just, yeah. Yeah, totally. I mean, we actually looked into like, uh, for instance, the patent data as well, right? For these app developers, we found that like a very few of them, right? Uh, these third party app developers are uh, patenting. Either it's because it's impossible to patent like software innovation in this context. Uh, it's just like uh, they, they are not, that strategic, right? They were not willing to invest that amount of effort or money into it. Yeah, so so I indeed, right? So the reason that the platforms can enter, right, so easily in this case is also presumably because it's the lack of IP protection, etc. right? So in uh, other markets, I would expect that uh, if uh, they could patent it or they could uh, like uh, even uh, hide the innovation a little bit, right? And it uh, would significantly reduce the likelihood of this competition against platform owners. So uh, so, so in other words, in other markets, uh, in other Another setting, it might be interesting to look at their other strategies, right? So, so in this market, the only thing they can play with, right, would it be like do lots of innovation, right? Do all these updates, new releases, playing with price. But there could be other strategic variables in other settings they could play with, and uh, and, uh, and and we have to leave it uh, for future research, I guess, right? So in this case, we actually looked, but didn't find anything. Yeah, didn't find that very much.